Okay, so good morning. Uh, yesterday we saw that uh, we we saw to compute the CP asymmetry, and uh, we saw uh, with more details so to compute uh, the efficiency factor from integrating uh, the Boltzmann equations and what are the typical uh, uh, quantity in those Boltzmann equation which determines if there is a, a suppression of the efficiency or not. So let's go now to some uh, co consequences of, those, of, this, of all this. So in fact, there are two kind of uh, features that makes that uh, leptogenesis uh, can uh, account for the baryon asymmetry of the universe in a very easy way. And though, I mean, uh, it was not guaranteed from the beginning that uh, all the scales would match very well, but in fact, they match very well. So the, the first one is um, about uh, the fact that the typical uh, CISO scale, so the mass is for the right-handed right neutrinos unit, to account for the neutrino masses, uh, when you assume that the CISO is really uh, working, I mean, uh, that the, ta the smallness of the uh, light neutrinos is coming from the fact that the right and dead neutrinos would be heavy. This matches very well with the typical scales you need for the masses of the right and dead neutrinos to have a successful uh, baryogenesis through leptogenesis. So, Basically, uh, CISO scales uh, from the neutrino mass constraint and from leptogenesis. The scales you need are uh, uh, matching very well. So to see that, uh, you have to... Here we will first uh, consider uh, the case where uh, the lightest right and dead neutrino, and we have seen that in general it is the one which will dominate the asymmetry production. It's much lighter than... Uh, the two other ones. So that you could assume uh, because in the standard model uh, all uh, fermion masses are hierarchical. So you can take this limit. And uh, you write down the CP asymmetry in this case. And if you take the expression for the CP asymmetry I gave yesterday and uh, take this limit, you get that the CP asymmetry for N1 is minus 3 over 16 pi, sum of k equal to 3, mn1 over mnk. And um, the usual uh, combination of the Yukawa um, coupling, which I can write in this way, So you take uh, y nu, y nu dagger is a matrix, three by three, and you take uh, the one, one k element. In fact, you sum over light lepton flavor in between when you do that. And then you have um, y nu, y nu dagger, one, one. So you take the one, one element of this uh, product of two matrices. Now, if you do that, what you can see is that um, since the, the neutrino mass matrix 
is, as we have seen, um, minus v square over 2 times y nu t um, mn minus 1 y nu. You can see that, um, in fact, you have twice the Yukawa coupling of the um, of the of the of the right-handed neutrino, which is in the which is in the one-loop diagram, and so um, you can and then you have a one over m n k here, and so you can see that the combination of Yukawa couplings of the virtual right-handed neutrino is coming proportional to the contribution it has to the neutrino masses. So typically, you can write it's minus 3 over 8 pi um, mn1 over v square imaginary part of um, y nu m nu star, because there is a dagger on the k Yukawa matrix, times y nu 1, 1, uh, 1 k, sorry. No, this is 1, 1, 1, 1, um, over some of, um, no, no, sum here. Over y nu, y nu dagger, um, one one. And you take the absolute value because in the denominator it's a total decay width, so you you have y nu, y nu dagger. Okay, so um, so you see that in fact each virtual right-handed neutrino contribute proportionally to the contribution it has to the neutrino mass matrix. And now you can um, go even one step further. You use this famous uh, decomposition y nu is equal to square root of 2 over v mn uh, one half times r times m nu um, m nu diagonal one half. Again, I am not taking enough space. So um, times uh, u p m n s. Dagger, we have seen that we can decompose the y nu uh, coupling 3 by 3 matrix in this way. You plug this y nu expression here, and you see that uh, your final CP asymmetry can be written as minus 3 over 16 pi times, uh, okay, I will write it there. So, Epsilon N1 is equal to minus 3 over 16 pi MN1 over V square sum of M nu J square. These are the light uh, neutrino masses. Imaginary part of R 1j squared divided by sum of, uh, so this is a sum over j equal to 1, 2, 3, sum over um, i of m nu i r 1i squared. You just do this substitution, you will see that. So what we see, and I will come back to that, it depends mostly 
on the values of the light neutrino masses, which is nice, we can have access to those masses, but also mostly on the values of those famous entries of the, of the R matrix, which is the, the matrix of the decoupling of the decoupling parameters. The parameters in the Yukawa coupling matrix we cannot have access to from determining the, the, the light neutrino mass matrix. Okay, but this is not the point here. We we'll come back to that. The point now is that from that, given the fact that R is a complex orthogonal matrix, you can use a Schwartz uh, inequality and you can uh, bound this. Uh, I mean, there is an upper bound which exists for this um, expression, which is that epsilon n1 is 3 is smaller or equal to 3 over 16 pi v square m nu 3 minus m nu 1. So, um, so these are the, this is the heaviest neutrino mass and the lightest neutrino mass. You can show that just by, from properties of uh, orthogonal complex matrices. Okay? And so this is smaller than uh, 3 over 16 pi m n1 uh, v square delta m square nu 3 1 um, in fact, it's, uh, yeah. So I mean, uh, we don't know the absolute scale of the neutrino masses, but we know this. This is uh, 2.5, 10 to the minus 3 EV square. And we know that m nu 3 minus u nu 1, in the best case, is equal to the square root of that. So, but uh, if, um, if uh, you increase the absolute scale, then uh, m nu 3 minus m nu 1 will be smaller than that. I mean, uh, del times square nu 3 1 is m square nu 3 minus m square nu 1. Okay, so it is m nu 3 minus m nu 1 over the sum. So I mean, if uh, m nu 1 is 0, then you get this. But if you increase the overall scale, you see that this is smaller than this. Okay, because the denominator will increase and uh, Okay. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, yeah, it's the product, yeah, of course. I was a bit confused, yes. I am more, yeah. Just uh, I would, sometimes you are too close to the blackboard. Okay. So, um, so now. So yeah, there is an upper bound on this CP asymmetry. And now requiring that uh, you get um, NB over S of order 10 to the minus 10, as we know. Then uh, since this is equal to 28 over 79, Epsilon N1, uh, N, N1 over S at temperature above MN1. Um, times the efficiency of the lightest right handed neutrino, because I assume that it dominates totally the production the decay of the, light, the lightest neutrino, as I said yesterday. So then you see that uh, in the best case, since eta efficiency is equal to 1, in the best case, 
you see that um, you need that MN1 is bigger than 4 10 to the AGV because the CP asymmetry is proportional to MN1. Okay? So you see that uh, if you have a hierarchical spectrum of right-handed neutrino masses, um, you need uh, the mass to be quite big. But this is quite nice in a way because we know from neutrino mass is that uh, if we want to explain that the neutrino mass is are of order 0.1 EV or less, uh, I mean, uh, if the mass is above this scale, you can, uh, the CISO is fully operative. I mean, uh, you, 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 you get a big suppression which uh, points towards those uh, EV scales, okay? So that's the first um, kind of coincidence. I mean, uh, this scale is determined by the value of the baryon asymmetry you observe, okay? So it could have been very different. I mean, uh, you could have got a much bigger number here, and that could be a problem for uh, getting enough uh, baryon asymmetry. Okay? So that's one thing. Now, um, yeah, this is called the Davidson Ibarra bound. We can know that it is obtained when really you take the limit that uh, these, one, these masses are much bigger than those ones. But if you take um, a kind of mild hierarchy, for example, MN2, 3 is equal to 10 times MN1, which is kind of uh, something you can do because after all, the light neutrino mass is, for example, if MU1 is zero, M nu3 is the square root of that, so 0.05 eV, and then from the other mass splitting, you get another mass which is five times smaller. So the typical hierarchy between the neutrino masses is not bigger than five, at least for the two heaviest ones. So if you take this CISO formula, if you want to account for a mild hierarchy of the light neutrinos, it's much easier to get it if the right-handed neutrinos are not highly hierarchical. So if you take, for example, a factor 10 here, you can show that you can go below, in fact. Uh, uh, especially if you, if you take uh, R entries which are big, so I would say this Davidson Ibarra, which was presented often as a true real bond, is really the relevant bond because it's the typical bond you need to satisfy when you don't play, for example, with large R entries. But it's not, a, it's not an absolute bond. Even uh, with a mild hierarchy, you can go down to I don't know, 10 to the 6 GV, 10 to the 5 GV in some cases. So it's good to know. But this sets the scales typically. Okay. Now, the second coincidence is probably more impressive. It is um, uh, M nu uh, versus uh, V electroweak versus M Planck. Coincidence. So, this famous uh, fake factor KN1, we've seen yesterday that if, uh, so this is um, gamma N1 total over H at T equal to MN1. We've seen yesterday that if it's bigger than one, you will get suppression of the efficiency, okay? So, um, it turns out that um, there is a lower bound on this uh, factor, which is given by um, M nu min over a scale which is 10 to the minus 3 EV. So 
how do we get this bound? Gamma n1 total is proportional to y nu 1i square over m n1 sum over i. Okay. They were, uh, uh, sorry, you know, so times, it's times m n1 for the decay width, and then the Hubble constant is proportional to t square, t square over, but t square is taken to be m n1 square, so you have a m n1 square over m Planck in the Hubble rate. Okay? Whereas this one has a, is proportional to the, I mean, the neutrino mass is are proportional to y nu uh, mn minus 1 y nu. So here you have the y nu, y nu dagger, but in the neutrino mass you have y nu, y nu, okay? So you can intuitively understand that uh, the absolute value will be always, I mean, uh, we, we get here something which goes like y nu square over mn1, so it's like the neutrino masses, except that you have the absolute value square, whereas in the neutrino masses you have y nu times y nu. There is no dagger there. So you can uh, understand that in this case you will get such a bound. And the 10 to the minus 3 EV scale is a combination of uh, I mean, here there is also a v square over 2. So it's a combination of uh, v, the Planck mass, and uh, that's it. So you have, you have a 17 a pi, because in the Planck, in the, in the Hubble scale, there is this 17 uh, factor, 8 pi. The 8 pi is because in the decay width you have an 8 pi here. I don't want to be totally detailed, but you have an 8 pi v square and then uh, over m Planck. So if you look at this value of the scale, you see that it's quite nice coincidence. I mean, uh, this scale, not to get I mean, we know that the neutrino mass is there around this scale, or maybe a factor of uh, 100 times more if it's 0.1 EV, but it is not uh, 1 million times more, okay? So this scale, which has nothing to do with the neutrino masses, because it's a combination of the electroweak scale and the Planck scale, okay? The Planck scale, as you know, is 10 to the 19 GV. Nothing to do with... Uh, a priori with uh, neutrino masses and so on. Okay, so this scale, which has nothing to do with uh, what we are looking for, is basically of the order of the neutrino masses. Okay, so m nu min is the lightest neutrino mass, so it's typically m nu one. Okay, so you could have m nu one equal to zero. And then uh, your gamma can be as small as you want. But, uh, and then you have no, uh, so k is very small, which means there is no suppression of the efficiency. But uh, you could also have uh, m nu at 0.1 uh, eV. And then uh, k would be 100 which is not small, but it is not huge either. I mean, you can live with uh, factor k equal to 100. It will give you some suppression of the efficiency, but this, this, this will still be okay. So the bottom line is that uh, there is a true coincidence there, which was not trivial, which uh, is such that whatever is the neutrino mass you take more or less in agreement with what we know about the neutrino mass, is still you can uh, have successful leptogenesis. Neutrino mass is at the Kiwi scale, for example, would have uh, killed uh, the leptogenesis mechanism uh, from the start, because the k factor would be one million, and that would be too small. Yeah. yeah.
naively, I would think that it's pretty hard to saturate this bond in general, no? I mean, let's say if really the lightest one is just massless, the total decay rate will... Yeah, if it's massless, you have no problem anyway. Yeah, but uh, can you really choose all the parameters such that the full k tot ah. is, is vanishing, no? I mean, can no, you saturate I mean, this? Uh, something I didn't say is that um, you need... Um, you need as many right-handed neutrinos as um, you as a number of non-zero light neutrino masses. Mm -hmm. So if m nu one is equal to zero, it's perfectly possible that uh, it basically it means that the Yukawa couplings of at least one of them are very small. So right. in this sense, it is natural. Yeah. yeah. But typically, you don't expect that the lightest one will be necessarily the one to give you the, the smallest mass. Mm. So typically, you, could as you, you would expect uh, that uh, you get uh, the, the atmospheric splitting or the solar splitting, I mean, one of those two splittings, square root. And then in one case, you have a, fac I mean, uh, then you have a factor 50 for k. And that's okay, okay? So, um, so that's a true coincidence, which is really uh, the reason why leptogenesis is success can be easily successful, okay? Now, it turns out that, in fact, uh, maybe I go there. So, it turns out that, um, in fact, the... There exists, if you assume a highly hierarchical spectrum of right-handed neutrino masses, there exists um, so an upper bound on the neutrino masses beyond which you cannot go. So for MN1 much smaller than MN2, 3, um, successful leptogenesis requires typically that m nu is smaller than 0.12 eV. So if, if the, I mean, if one mass for the, for the light neutrinos is 0.12 eV, then we are already in a case where m nu 1 is very close to m nu 2, is very close to m nu 3, and I call it m nu, and it's equal to 0.12 eV. Okay, I mean, 0.12 eV, you are already above the square root of the biggest mass splitting, which is 0.05 eV. So for such a mass, you are already in, uh, in the case where the three masses are about the same with delta m square, which are smaller than the scale. So you are in the case of a quasi-degenerate spectrum of light neutrinos. And you can show that uh, you cannot go above. So it's no problem at all, because we know that we can live perfectly with uh, masses smaller than that. Okay? We know that at least one mass has to be at least 0.01. O5 EV and the two others smaller. So I mean, we are not ruling out at all leptogenesis if you do that, but still you have a bound. So from where is coming this bound? So I mean, even if you have that, I still, uh, the, this coincidence is still fully, uh, fully, uh, fully there. So, and, and explain why it works well. So, there are two reasons why we get this bound. The first one is that um, I just repeat the bound there, 3 over 4 pi, uh, sorry, it's uh, 16 pi mn1 over v square times uh, times m nu 3 minus m nu 1. And so what you see is that this m nu 3 minus m nu 1 is 
square root is um, delta m square. Um, it is uh, delta m square nu 3 1 divided, it is here that it was in the denominator, divided by m nu 3 uh, minus uh, plus m nu 1. And so if you are already in a quasi-degenerate case, it's 2 m nu. So what you see is that when you increase m nu, you decrease the CP asymmetry. So this decrease when m nu increase. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is that, um, is this one. I mean, uh, if you increase the neutrino mass uh, absolute by, uh, overall scale, m nu mean will increase. So Kn1 uh, in this case is uh, m nu min, but uh, over uh, 10 to the minus 3 EV. But this m nu min is equal to, to m nu in this case, up to small splittings. Okay. So it means it increases when m nu uh, increase. So you have more washout. Okay? This k factor, when it is bigger than 1, so for example, for 0.12 EV, you get a factor 120 here. So k is already quite big, and that's why you have already some washout. The typical washout in this case will be uh, eta will be 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So you get a suppression, okay? So this is, um, uh, in this case, I mean, I said if you have neutrino masses of order KV, leptogenesis doesn't work. Anyway, whatever you do. But uh, in fact, uh, already for 0.12 EV, if you assume a big hierarchy, you, you cannot have successful leptogenesis anymore, but that's perfectly fine because we have still plenty of, I mean, neutrino masses are anyway there, huh? uh, nearby, okay? So, um, okay, now, again, um, I, mean, I say this uh, davidson Ibarra band is um, quite nice because it tells you typically what is the CISO scale you need to have successful leptogenesis if, if you don't play too much. Now here, you even don't need to play to go around this bound. Because uh, if you are at 0.12 EV, as I said, it means that the three, given the fact that we know that the mass splittings are smaller, it means we are already in the case of a quasi-degenerate spectrum. Now, if you want to explain a quasi-degenerate spectrum from the CISO formula, which is this one, y nu t mn minus one y nu, if you assume a huge uh, hierarchy, you need to, I mean, if you start from uh, right-handed neutrinos which are really hierarchical, it's extremely difficult to get the three light neutrinos to be uh, with the same mass. You need cancellations everywhere. Okay, because you need, uh, I mean, the three M N will be quite different. And then, uh, how comes you get the three uh, same light neutrino masses? If you have a quasi-degenerate spectrum of light neutrinos, it's much easier to get it if you assume that the right-handed neutrinos are themselves quasi-degenerate. If you have only one scale here, approximately, then it's easy to get the same scale here. But if you have uh, three very different scales here, uh, you really need cancellation between the Yukawas of each uh, right-handed neutrino and its mass to give you, at the end of the day, the same mass. So in fact, this bond applies to a quasi-degenerate spectrum of light neutrinos. But if light neutrinos are quasi-degenerate, 
this assumption is really questionable. In fact, it's not natural at all. You can instead assume that to explain a quasi-degenerate spectrum, the right-handed neutrino mass would be themselves quasi-degenerate. And then you can explain in a much easier way why the light neutrinos would be quasi-degenerate. And as you will see later today, if the right-handed neutrinos are quasi-degenerate, then we have a resonant enhancement of the CP asymmetry. You, get, you can get much bigger CP asymmetries. And then forget about this bound. You can go to one EV very easily. And one EV, we know from Catherine experiment, that one EV, you cannot go be, below, beyond one EV. So it means that there is no relevant upper bound, in fact, on, uh, on uh, neutrino masses, given the fact that we know already the mass splitting. And so we know that if the new absolute mass scale is above 0.1 EV, then the three, right, the three light neutrinos are quasi-degenerate. Okay? It's a discussion we had uh, 20 years ago. Um, I mean, this is due to Buchmuller et al. And we were uh, basically simply saying that uh, forget about this assumption if you assume such a value. And in this case, if you forget about this assumption, there is no more bound below 1 EV. And uh, experimentally, we know it has to be below 1 EV anyway. Now, on top of that, as I will also explain today, there are some flavor effects coming, which can come on top of that. And they also relax this bound. So this bond is not really something uh, people consider so much anymore. OK, so to sum up so far, we see that uh, the scales are really matching very well, OK? Especially this uh, inequality is uh, such that leptogenesis can work very well. But it's not easy to do uh, really precise predictions. And to see that, we have to come back at this level. And what we see is that the CP asymmetry is um, proportional to the neutrino mass scale, the three light neutrino masses. And that's a scale which fits very well with what we need, but also depends on the entries of this R matrix. And as I said, this R matrix parameterize the six parameters, three angles and three phases, which we cannot determine by determining the light neutrino mass matrix. Okay, so these are the six parameters in the Yukawa coupling matrix, which we have no access to. We should go to very high energy to really see them, okay, if the, if the right handed neutrinos are at very high energies. So in, pa in particular, the phases here are the phase, the high energy phases, the decoupling phases. And you have also a dependence here. So you can assume typically that those uh, entries are of order one. It's an orthogonal complex matrix. But this is just an assumption. They could be also very different. Okay, you could have cancellations between the different entries. So you can, I mean, uh, To sum up, leptogenesis is really uh, benefiting from those two, two coincidences in such a way that it looks extremely easy to account for the baryon asymmetry of the universe, but we cannot be precise in uh, I may make a precise prediction. And um, on top of that, in this picture, the right-handed neutrinos are quite heavy. So extremely difficult to see. I mean, uh, we are not going to produce uh, particles uh, of, with this mass at uh, LHC, for example. Okay? So that's the bottom line uh, for the, the, I mean, for about the basic picture of uh, uh, how far we can go uh, to predict really what should be the baryon asymmetry along the leptogenesis mechanism. 
Okay, now I go to what I mentioned one minute ago. I go to the flavor effects. So these are effects which were introduced uh, in 2006 and 7. There were many papers on those effects. So in fact, so far, what did we do? So far, what we did is to not to look at the flavor of the leptons you, you produce. We were never... So basically, what we were doing is the Boltzmann equation. We were counting the number of leptons we produce and destroy from decays and inverse decays. And we were not taking care of which flavor we produce when from the decays and uh, which flavor are uh, entering in the, into the inverse decays. Okay, so, so far we were just counting the number of um, leptons created or uh, uh, annihilated through inverse decays. Okay? And in fact, this is... Uh, Totally, uh, this is no problem at all if uh, you are at uh, temperature above um, 10 to the 12 GV when you create the CP asymmetry. So if the masses are above 10 to the 12 GV. Why? Because at those temperatures, the Yukawa coupling of the standard model where you have uh, x doublet a tau, so in this case, uh, yeah, a tau, um, a tau left and a tau right, and here uh, the neutral component of the x doublet. So the Yukawa coupling, giving the masses to the tau, for example, tau leptons uh, in the standard model. In fact they are out of equilibrium. So you take uh, the gamma, tau, divide by h, and you can see that this is smaller than 1 at those temperatures. So it means that uh, it's like if this interaction was not existing at those temperatures. But now if you are at lower temperatures, then the thermal, ball, the thermal bath will start to feel this interaction, okay? which means that uh, basically um, uh, N going to LH, so you have an N1, for example, here. In fact, it will create creates uh, a lepton, a charged lepton, which I call L tilde, which will be just given by uh, the, I mean, it's proportional to Y nu 1 E times E plus Y nu 1 mu times mu plus Y nu 1 tau times tau. So I mean, uh, each time an N1 decays, it will create a lepton, which is a combination of the three flavors, proportionally to each Yukawa coupling. Okay? And when you are above 10 to the 12 GV, the Boltzmann equations is just count the number of L tilde you create or annihilate. Okay? And uh, so you always create leptons along this flavor combination. However, once you go below 10 to the 12 GV, the tau component of this uh, combination you create, from time to time, will undergo a Yukawa coupling, which means you will break the coherence of this state, which means that at this point, you cannot use only one Boltzmann equation for this for counting the number of L tilde, nothing else. So basically, it means 
at t smaller than 10 to the 12 GeV, you need a two Boltzmann equation. You need a one for the number of two you create and annihilate, and one for the number of, um, I mean, the other combination here, so E plus mu, okay? Because uh, this rate will appear in the Boltzmann equation, and uh, since uh, only the two Yukawa coupling is big enough here for the corresponding interaction to happen in the thermal bath, uh, you have, uh, if you want to do it well, you have to count the number of two and the number of uh, other combination. Okay, so you have two Boltzmann equation, and uh, so it changed the picture. Okay. Similarly, when you go below uh, at even lower temperature, at some point the muon Yukawa coupling, which is smaller than the one of the two, proportionally to the masses. Will uh, enter to play a role. Will start to play a role in the thermal bath. If I I am understand, this is the tau part of the standard model. Yeah, but the charge lepton. Uh, in this scale of temperature, this part code does not exist. No, no, no. It exists. I mean. Uh, in this scale of temperature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, the gauge interactions uh, have a coupling even bigger than the Toyukawa coupling. The gauge interaction, they start, if you do the, this, if you look the con this condition for the gauge interactions, you can see that uh, they begin to be in thermal equilibrium at 10 to the 17 GV. Mm -hmm. So all, I mean, uh, at 10 to the 17 GV, all uh, standard model particles are already there, thermalized. Oh. Okay. But they are massless, yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, they will get mass at the electroweak phase transition much, much after. Okay. So now, similarly, at to, uh, t smaller than uh, 10 to the 9 GeV, you can see that uh, gamma Yukawa mu is, is bigger than H, so you need three Boltzmann equation. One for E, one for mu, one for tau. Okay? Because the muons sometimes uh, they will uh, undergo this Yukawa interaction, and uh, so you need that. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering, I mean, strictly speaking, wouldn't you need a density matrix approach here in this regime? Because, I mean, if you, yeah. because even if you would be at large temperatures, I guess these three Boltzmann equations will not give the same result as this. Yeah, if you want to no? do it very well, you, you, you better you, mm. you, you, I mean, uh, it has to do with the fact that this state is coherent and those interactions right, is breaking right. the coherence. Yeah. So if you really want to do it well, you need the matrix density. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you get back the same result if you have the two or three Boltzmann equations and then go to large temperatures. So you mean if we... If, we, um, if this is equivalent... Take these two Boltzmann equations and, solve them and then go at large temperature, if summing the, them. In fact, you don't get exactly the same, but yeah, I don't okay. want to enter into those <laughs> details. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, but it's a good approximation yeah, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's one more question. I'm sorry. What's out of equilibrium? Is like the tau particle is decoupled from all the standard model particles, or this process out of equilibrium only? So, I mean. Uh, no, the tau, the tau is in thermal equilibrium anyway, from gauge interaction. But the gauge interactions, they are flavor blind. They are the same for all flavors. Mm -hmm. So they don't play any role here, except that they put the tau in, in uh, thermal equilibrium. So you don't need to see what are the process of the tau. You know that the tau, they have the thermal distribution, the number. But you have to look at this effect 
in this context. Yeah. OK, so um, in fact, more precisely, what you have to see is not to see only if this is bigger than uh, smaller than one. What you have to see is if a tau which is produced from a decay will undergo a Yukawa interaction before it undergoes, on average, an inverse decay. That's the real uh, condition, but I am not going to, to elaborate too much on that. So typical flavor effects, I will not uh, go through the Boltzmann equation and so on to take too much time. So, so typically, you, you have many effects. For example, due to those flavor effects, you, ca you can have a reduction of the washout. So if you are in a regime where k and one is bigger than one, then you have some washout. I mean, in the one flavor approximation, if k is bigger than one, you will have some washout. Okay. Now, in the two flavor, I mean, but if you are at Below the, this temperature, this is not uh, fully correct. You have to consider two Boltzmann equations, or even the matrix density, if you want to do it very well. And uh, in this case, so for example, in the two flavor approximation, uh, or let's say case, it's not an approximation in this case. Then you can have uh, certain cases where there is no more washout. So you can gain, you can gain, uh, it's even easier for leptogenesis to work. So typically you can take, for example, gamma N1 going to Li plus mu H to be much bigger than gamma N1 going to L to H. Here I mean that the Yukawa coupling here is uh, the component of the tau in this combination is much smaller than the rest. And so in this case, this will be washed out because we know that the total decay is bigger than one. So if this one is dominant, this one will be bigger than one. So you will have a big washout of this component, but less washout in the other, uh, in the other Boltzmann equation counting the number of toes. So you can gain in this way. But this is valid for, the, for a case where you have already a lot of washout. So for example, it will not change the lower bound on MN1, 10 to the HGV, because this lower bound was obtained assuming no washout, so k is smaller than 1. So uh, um, this can change uh, quite by a factor of a few, typically. Uh, you can get more, but typically with a factor of a few for the lepton asymmetry you produced, but only in the case you've already some washout, okay? So for, uh, so it doesn't affect the bond uh, MN1 smaller, uh, bigger than 4, 10 to the AGV, because this bond was obtained for an efficiency equal to one for the best case where there were no washout, OK? Now, another example is what, what is called N2-3 leptogenesis. So I say that uh, in the one flavor case, the L asymmetries created from the decays 
of N2 and N3 will be washed out by the interaction of, the, of N1, typically. Okay? Uh, are washed out by N1 Yukawa interactions. Okay? Now, in the two flavor uh, case, or even three flavor case at lower temperature, it's not the case anymore because, uh, again, you can have, for example, uh, N2 and N3, they will create, for example, a lot of E and mu, but not so many toes. And if N1 has kind of orthogonal couplings, then um, it will not wash out the e, uh, it will, for example, wash out the toe component, but not the E and mu, and the E and mu will survive. Okay? So, uh, not true anymore. Similarly, uh, something I didn't talk about, but this is, uh, it has to do with initial um, asymmetries. In the one flavor case, they will be washed out. So suppose that after inflation or at the time of uh, at the end of inflation, you already produce some asymmetries. Then what was nice in the so far for leptogenesis is that uh, N1, N2, and N3 they will totally erase those asymmetries from the washout term. But this is not true anymore uh, with N flavor because uh, you can play again with flavor. For example, if the initial, if the initial uh, primordial asymmetry has a toe component, and if the right-handed neutrinos are coupled mainly to E and mu, but you, you will not erase it. In fact, in general, you will still erase it because if you pass through the washout of the tree, Right and that neutrinos, you, you will cover all flavors, but uh, it's not always the case. You can play with the reheating temperature. For example, if the reheating temperature is smaller than the mass of uh, two and three, then there is only N1, which is washing out everything. And this one can have a small coupling to tau. So, for example, a tau primordial asymmetry will, will survive. Okay? Now, Similarly, another effect is that um, another effect is that uh, has to do with the CP violating phase dependence. So we have seen that in the one flavor approximation. The CP violating phase, which are contributing to leptogenesis, are the phases, the three phases in R, which you cannot determine anyway. Now, in the N flavor case, in fact, the six phases can contribute. Not only the three in R, but also the three phases in the light neutrino mass matrix. So you can interpret that in two ways. You can say, ah, that's good, because then I, I get a sensitivity in the phases. I can maybe determine at least some of them in the neutrino mass matrix. But you can also interpret that in the other way, saying it's even, more, uh, it's even less predictive, because you will have a dependence on the low energy phases, but also on the high energy phases. And there is no reason at all why only the low energy phases would be different from zero and the high energy no, because um, these three high energy phases and the three phases in the light neutrino mass matrix are a complicated combination of the original phase you have in the Yukawa coupling matrix. So there is no reason why uh, 
you would have only the low energy phases and no high energy phase. I mean, the six phase here are the three in R and the three in M nu. Okay. So there are people, they were playing, okay, I assume I have only the Dirac phase, here can I have successful leptogenesis, including flavor effects? The answer is yes, but it's just an exercise, because there is no reason why you would have only um, a flavor, uh, uh, this phase to be different from zero, because this phase is a complicated combination of the phase, original phases in the Yukawa coupling matrix at high energy. So, I mean, nature doesn't care at about what it gives at uh, low energy. Nature will care about the structure of the Yukawa coupling matrix in the Lagrangian. And from this structure, you will get uh, whatever you get at low energy. And there is no reason why there would be only a Dirac phase. Okay. Now, a last case for uh, flavor leptogenesis is uh, a purely flavor leptogenesis framework. So that quite qualitatively is really something uh, new that you can do only with flavor. I mean, these cases, they, are relatively, they have relatively marginal effects. But uh, here you can have a completely new scenario. As I told you, when I take the one-loop diagram with uh, the leptons in the same direction, in the one flavor case, you will get zero, because there is no CP violation when you sum over. Uh, so basically, when you, I, I, I told you the, the, it means you have no Majorana mass insertion. I mean, here you have L equal to one, and here you have L equal to one, okay? H, H, okay? So I told you we need explicit lepton number violation in the diagram to get uh, some CP asymmetry, to, to get an effect. And I said if, because the original diagrams, uh, you had uh, arrows in opposite direction. But if now the, the arrows are in the same direction, in the one flavor case, you get zero. But in the several flavor case, you don't get zero. So typically, the point is that you will get an asymmetry to create, uh, for example, uh, leptons in the final state with a flavor J, okay? Which is, so we call them flavor. Uh, changing asymmetry. So you can compute this, and this is gamma n times Ljh minus gamma n going to Lj bar h star over gamma n total. So when you compute that, you can see that all individual asymmetries have no reason to be zero. But the sum of uh, the three flavor asymmetries is zero, because the sum of the three flavor asymmetries is an asymmetry which breaks the to total lepton number. But here you don't break total lepton number. So the sum has to be anyway zero, but the individual flavor asymmetries have no reasons to be zero. So in the one flavor case, you care only about the, the sum of all flavor asymmetries. You just count the number of leptons and antileptons, and this gives you zero because you don't break lepton number. But in the flavor case, you could consider a case where uh, you have uh, one flavor asymmetry which would be washed out because the Yukawa couplings would be big. 
and another one which would be not washed out because the Yukawa couplings are small. So you can consider for the for the n flavor case, uh, you can consider um, for, let's say n equal to two. So you will have epsilon two equal to minus epsilon e plus mu. That anyway, but this one could be uh, washed out if uh, the Yukawa new one to are large, and this one can be not washed out. If the Yukawa one e mu are small, and at the end of the day, you get uh, you get uh, a net lepton asymmetry, even though you uh, you had no uh, original. Uh, I mean, you have no delta L equal to two mass insertions. Okay, so these are uh, examples. Okay, now let's go to the next. Uh, Section, which is also important, it has to do with the, what you get when the right handed neutrinos have similar masses. So, quasi degenerate spectrum of ends. Okay. So um, we have seen that we have a diagram, which is a self-energy diagram. Okay. And uh, when you compute uh, what it gives for the CP asymmetry, it gives one over eight pi. The imaginary part of the Yukawa couplings over. Uh, Two Yukawa couplings, and uh, after you have mn1 over mn2 times a factor s12. So that you get from the expression I got. So typically, um, s12, we have seen that it was m square n1 over, uh, no, n2, sorry over m square n2 minus m square n1. So when n2 is much heavier than n1, it is equal to 1, this factor. When mn2 is bigger than mn1. Okay? This comes from the propagator of the n2. Now you can ask the question, why, uh, wh what happens when those two masses are equal, okay, or close to be equal? If you do that, then you have to, uh, if you ask this question, you have to, uh, to take into account the effect of the decay width in the propagator. You have to take bright Wigner propagators. That was the question raised to Yazon at the end of his course today. So typically, you have to go back to this expression m1, m0 star, which is proportional to 1 over m square n1 minus m square n2. And then you have to take into account the, the effect of the width, the decay width. I mean, it's the propagator of n2. So you will get the decay width of n2 times mn1 because this is the, the energy which is uh, flowing. Okay, now m0, m1 star m0 will give you the same thing, but with a minus here. Okay, so you have to sum these two. And if you sum these two, you see now that s12 will not be any more I mean, you have the finite width effect to this S12. 
Yes, S12 will be m square n2, m square n1 minus m square n2 divided by m square n2 um, minus m square n1 square plus gamma n2 square mn2 mn1 square. You see that right away, no? So now, if I plot this uh, S12, factor as a function of mn2 minus mn1, so here you have 0. What you see is that you have a resonance peak. And here you have 1. So when the splitting is very big, you go back to this because the decay widths are negligible. You get one. But when you have mn2 minus mn1 equal to gamma n2, so of the order of, um, of um, the decay width, then you get a usual resonance. Okay. And uh, when both masses are equal, so that's, I mean, the decay wave is always much smaller than the mass. So you really need a very tiny mass splitting there to, to be on the resonance. And when you, have the, when you have a mass splitting which is zero, the CP asymmetry is zero. And that's one more manifestation of the fact that CP violation always need mass splitting. This is always true, also true in the standard model. So you have a resonance peak, and as a result, uh, everything is changing, in fact, with respect to the hierarchical case. So, first of all, epsilon n1, uh, which was bounded from below by an expression proportional to mn1 times m nu 3 minus m nu 1. Now, it's just bounded by the value 1 half. So basically, epsilon n1 plus epsilon n2, because now you have two quasi-degenerate uh, right-handed neutrinos. So you have to take into account the decays from both of them, because they are basically at the same mass. And you can show that CP violation is just bounded by, I mean, it's an asymmetry, and the maximal value you can get for an asymmetry is one. Okay? So the asymmetry can be huge if you are really on the peak. Okay? So it means no more lower bound on MN1. So, for example, uh, mn1 equal to mn2 equal uh, v, electroweak, the electroweak scale, is um, a possibility. Okay? So, we are now in, the, in a scenario which is called resonant leptogenesis at low scale. Okay? Now, you have also no more. I mean, the, what you need, if you still want uh, DK to produce it from DK to LH, you need uh, MN to be bigger than typically uh, ML plus MH. So you need to be above 100 GV or so. Okay? But that's the only restriction you have in this case. After, we can even go below, but I think I will have no time to explain that. So. So there is a next term is that there is no more m nu uh, upper bound. I mean uh, below the Catherine one. I mean, uh, okay, and that I explained already why because I said that if uh, you are, for example, at one eV, your light neutrinos are highly quasi-degenerate, and if you want to explain that to the CISO formula, it's much easier if the right-handed neutrinos are themselves quasi-degenerate, and then you have the resonance, no more bound. Okay? Now, um, the next point 
has to do with the test of low scale leptogenesis. So you could say, ah, now I am at low scale. So I could say, that was a question you asked, or you, ra you raised already several times. You could say, ah, but then I, I could produce those right handed neutrinos at LHC. In fact, it's not so easy because if Mn is of order V, for example, TV or so, then the Yukawa coupling, typically you expect them to be 10 to the minus 7. If you put that in the CISO formula. In this case, you have no more uh, CISO mass suppression, like if you were at 10 to the 15 GV. So if you want small neutrino masses, you need small Yukawa couplings, typically. Okay? And then, since the right-handed neutrinos are gauge singlets of the standard model, you cannot produce them. You cannot produce them through Drellian uh, pair production uh, from gauge interactions, and you cannot produce them from such small Yukawa couplings. So that's the typical uh, situation that uh, if you don't play at all, you will not be able to see those right-handed neutrinos, even if they are around the corner for what concerns the mass scale. And then, uh, whether, so if you nevertheless still want to see if there is any possibility to see them if they are at this scale, in fact, you can think that uh, there are two main ways two main ways out. The first one is to consider that you have other gauge interaction beyond the standard model. I mean, other interaction beyond the standard model and beyond the Yukawa couplings. Okay? So production from other interactions. The best uh, well-known example is, uh, for example, in uh, left-right symmetric models. Uh, in the same way that you have uh, W left, E left, uh, new left interaction. Now, because the E left and U left are in SU2 left doublets, now in those kinds of models, you can have W right. E right, and then N right. Okay, and here you have, you have a coupling which, which is G right, and if it's truly symmetric, it's the same as the SU2 left coupling in the standard model. So then you could say, ah, I have a large interaction here with N and Ws at the TV scale, and LHC is really looking for uh, right-handed neutrinos, which could be produced by right-handed gauge interactions. Okay, so that you can see. I mean, in those models, you can produce the, you can see the right-handed neutrinos and the W right. I mean, true, true. Typically, at uh, LHC, what you will consider is a Q Q bar interaction going. So Q right, huh? going to uh, E right uh, and right, OK? And these couplings are large, and the W right is at TV, and then you can see the right and the neutrinos. However, for leptogenesis, if you have that, this is not, this is not compatible with leptogenesis. So this is maybe the last thing. OK, no, still. Uh, yeah, uh, my time is exactly over, so maybe I will take five minutes. Uh, and, ah, yeah, I have still... Uh, ah, okay, then that's good, yeah. I, I mixed the time. <laughs> so, okay, good, then I can do a bit more. So, um, typically, um, the point is that... Uh, let's go there. The point is that if you have such a right-handed currents charge interaction, 
charge right handed currents interaction, then this interaction will deeply thermalize the right handed neutrinos. And then you will get a suppression from the Boltzmann equation. So typically, any large, any extra large interaction for uh, the ends, they will thermalize the ends. So you go in the first uh, Boltzmann equation, dyn over dz. Then we have seen that we have a term coming from the Yukawa gamma d 1 minus yn over yn equilibrium. But now we will get an extra term, for example, from those scatterings. So we will get plus some uh, usual factor, gamma w right, I will call this. Uh, so this is the number of uh, transition of this form per uh, unit time and unit volume, times again 1 minus yn, yn equilibrium. And the point is that uh, if gamma w right is much bigger than gamma d, and it will be the case because that if you are at TV scale now for the right and the neutrino masses, the gamma d is proportional to two powers of 10 to the minus 7. But the gamma w right has four powers of uh, a big coupling, which is of order unity, like the gauge coupling in, on the left side in the standard model. So typically, it means that yn minus yn equilibrium will be highly suppressed. Much more than if there were no uh, W right, okay? And then you go back, you go to in the second Boltzmann equation, and uh, we have seen that there, the production, the source term for the CP asymmetry is gamma D, because it comes from the DK, times uh, 1 minus YN over YN, equilibrium times epsilon n. And then you have the other term, the washout term. And the point is that this will be very suppressed, much more suppressed than if there were no W right from the first Boltzmann's equation. And so you will have a YL suppressed. So it's another ma manifestation of the third Sakharov condition. There are two main kinds of suppression. You have the washout, which has to do with the fact that you first produce a L asymmetry, and after you statistically suppress it by the term, the washout term, which is proportional to YL gamma D. Okay? And then you have another kind of suppression, which is not at all uh, the same, which has to do with the fact that you thermalize a lot the right-handed neutrinos in the first Boltzmann equation, and then cannot produce a big asymmetry. So this is a thermalization suppression. So Sakharov condition can be uh, has to do with those two kinds of suppression, typical. And in many other uh, frameworks, you, uh, you have always to deal with those two kinds of suppression. Okay. And then you can see that in this case, even in the best case where you are on the peak here, okay, you really maximize the CP asymmetry, you can see that uh, uh, the W right has to be anyway uh, above 18 TV, and 18 TV is too, too big to see anything at LHC, okay? So to produce a right-handed neutrino through such kind of processes, okay? 
so this is uh, I think important to say because it's a typical uh, situation when you want to okay leptogenesis could work at low scale but you have to face uh, and then you could think about extra interactions but uh, that's fine to produce them but that's not good for leptogenesis Okay, now the second uh, way out has to do with, the, with this uh, configuration of the uh, CISO parameters where you can have big Yukawa couplings but still uh, tiny neutrino masses. So these are typically what are called the approximate um, L conserving, uh, co well, L conservation frameworks. So, as I said here, if uh, you are at the TV scale, at the electroweak scale, typically M nu, which is a Y nu square over MN. V square, but to get 0.1 TV, you need 10 to the minus 7. However, you can consider those kind of frameworks where you have much, la some of the Yukawa couplings are much larger. That's good for producing the right handed neutrinos, but still you get very tiny neutrino masses. So, just an example. So, an example with two ends. So typically, what you can say is that, okay, by ant, and these models, I mean, to assume such a approximate L conserving conservation is not really something which is motivated by a very deep uh, theoretical principle. It is assumed for the sake of seeing something. Okay, that's the main motivation, I think. So, ex so you can have a ex simple example with two ends where you have a matrix which has this form. So here you have new left. So this is uh, the equivalent of the six by six matrix. But now, for simplicity, I will take just one new L, one new one C. I mean, if the ends are right handed, you have to take the C to have everything left. And it has this structure, zero, Y, N, V, zero, Y n v zero m n zero m n v n uh, zero. So how do you justify that? You just say okay, new left as l equal to one, and then you you assume by n that n one as um, l equal to one also and N2 as L equal to 2. So you assume uh, typically uh, U1L, so just uh, U1 acting on these fields, and you say the, under this U1, uh, the charge is 1 for the right and left-handed neutrinos, 1 for the N1, and, uh, oh là là, and minus 1, sorry, for N2. Okay? Then you see that the N1 N2 and 3 is a load because you have minus 1 plus 1. But the N1, N1, and N2, N2 is not a load by the U1. And same here, the new left N1C is a load because it, it gives you 1 minus 1, but the N, new left N2C is not a load because it gives you 1 plus 1. Okay? Now you can, so in this case, you will get m nu equal to zero because you don't break lepton number. Okay? Uh, another way to say it is that uh, the determinant of this matrix is zero and then uh, some of the mass eigenvalues will be zero and these are the m nu. Okay? Now you can perturb this matrix saying, ah, but this U1L is not uh, a true symmetry. There is a small... Uh, breaking coming, and so you will have uh, Yn prime V, Yn prime V, 
mu and mu prime. And these are small perturbations. If you do that, then you get m nu, which is typically y nu, uh, y n, here I put some n and some not some nu, but y n prime v, 1 over m n, y n v square, minus y n t, 1 over m n, mu 1 over m n. And I think it's the mu prime here and mu here. And then there is a v square. So you will perturb, uh, you, you, don't, you have an approximate U1L conservation, and so you get neutrino mass is proportional to the small entries you put there. Okay, so you assume YN prime to be much smaller than YN, and mu and mu prime to be much smaller than MN. Then you get suppression here and suppression there, and so that's an example where some of the Yukawa couplings can be very big, but still, they don't give you any neutrino mass. Okay? And then, of course, you need small perturbations, very small other entries in such a way that at the end, your m nu is small. So if you do that, you can, uh, I mean, you can do it because it is, uh, I mean, uh, based on, on a symmetry. So typically, the small neutrino masses, they will be radiatively stable because they are protected by a symmetry. Okay? Even if you take the one-loop corrections to the neutrino masses, they will remain small because anyway, the neutrino mass is proportional to the small breaking at all orders. Okay? So that's one possibility. And if you do that, then um, typically, uh, it is uh, testable. You, I mean, you can. Uh, you will have production of n one two. Um, well, let's say of n's. I mean, proportionally to the y n. And um, uh, at LHC for. Uh, y n of order typically uh, 10 to the minus 2 uh, to 1. And people are looking for those right-handed neutrinos in this case. Okay, So that's a case where you can see something, and then you have to ask, what about leptogenesis in this case? And it turns out that one, uh, I mean, it's a bit ad hoc uh, framework, but one uh, nice property of this framework is that uh, for leptogenesis, in fact, uh, MN1, MN2 minus MN1, now let's say MNB minus MNA, which are the mass eigenstates, so when you diagonalize this matrix, you see that you will see, since it is purely of diagonal, you will get two masses which are the same up to small perturbations. So that will be proportional to mu and mu prime. So it means it is much smaller than MnB plus MnA. So what is nice in such kind of frameworks is that you get for f when you assume it to get uh, large Yukawa couplings to see something at LHC, you get for free a quasi-degenerate spectrum of right-handed neutrinos, which means that you have a resonance. Okay, so you have a resonance that's quite good for leptogenesis, but you. Still, you have to pay a price because the CP asymmetry, which is lepton number violating, will be necessarily proportional to the small L violating entries. So you have a resonance, uh, but epsilon n is proportional to L violating small entries. 
And then you have to you gain a lot here, you lose a lot there. You have to combine that. And if you go in corners of the parameter space, you can see that it's possible to have production at LHC, or let's say in the next uh, generation of colliders, whatever it is, <laughs> and uh, uh, compatible with uh, successful leptogenesis. OK, no, so my time is really over now. Um, Can, can I take five minutes more? So I have just one, one hour 30 now. Just okay. to, to, to sketch okay. in a few words what was remaining. So what was remaining are two things. The first one is that um, you can go even lower uh, in masses for the right-handed neutrinos. But I will not explain that at all. It's a long discussion. So I will just say that there were a section which was uh, leptogenesis with very small MN. So typically, here we are talking about MN uh, down to 100 MeV. In fact, When Mn is smaller than um, Mh plus Ml, there is no N to Lh decay. Okay, so you could say, okay, forget about leptogenesis. However, without any explanation, still you can have successful leptogenesis because N i N a oscillation, CP violating oscillation can still be operative. I mean, a bit in the same way that the uh, standard leptogenesis scenario I was uh, discussing, uh, you have, uh, at one loop, you have a CP violating transition between uh, two different NIs. So that you can still have, and it can still manifest itself in other processes than this one. For example, you can have uh, H to, L, uh, to LN. Or you can have various scatterings with the Yukawa couplings. And uh, CP violation can still manifest itself in this kind of processes. So, This is called the ARS um, framework. OK. Akhmedov, uh, Rubakov, Smirnov. And uh, there, typically, you produce, I will not explain how it works. It, you produce um, uh, L at temperature of order 10 to the 5 GeV. So it's not a low-scale leptogenesis. People uh, often they say, ah, it's very low-scale leptogenesis. No, it's a, it's a framework with very low right-handed neutrino masses, but still you produce it at a much higher energy than what can be probed typically. And uh, so here the finite temperature effect are uh, crucial. One reason is that you are at temperature much bigger than the mass, so all thermal corrections are important. And um, typically, you have to take into account uh, the coherence of, uh, I mean, uh, Ni and Nj, they, they, they basically uh, I mean, you have transition of this type, so it's basically you have oscillation between them, and uh, which means that you have a coherence between them. An oscillation is a coherent effect. Huh? So you need the uh, matrix density. I mean, one way to do it is the matrix density. You have to consider uh, a framework of this kind. 
And I think I will just say still that uh, this is a purely flavor uh, framework because uh, any, I mean, a bit like the purely flavor uh, mechanism I, explain, I mentioned, because uh, any delta L equal to 2 transition is suppressed by the small mass here. And so it's not so. So it was thought to be not so important, but uh, in fact, uh, it was shown that uh, the L violating uh, contribution, which is proportional to, is which is suppressed by M n square with respect to the purely flavor, is can be very important too because it has two two power of the Yukawa coupling suppression less. So. There is also um, plus L violating uh, contribution. This, it would be a pleasure to explain because uh, we did that uh, five years ago. That was the last time I was working on leptogenesis. But I will have no time. And then in 30 seconds, my last chapter, but I was not expecting to get so far was about the other CISO mechanism. And uh, just for your information, for example, if you have type 1 plus type 2, which is uh, very... Uh, uh, it's what you get in the most simple SO10 models, in fact. Then you can have, for example, a N1, which goes to LH. And then you have uh, the type 2 triplet, scalar triplet, remember. And here you have another L, and here another H. And you can have the contrary, delta HH. Um, with a N and LL. So, beside the pure type 1 uh, framework, I think this framework has to be uh, remembered because um, typically SO16, sorry, SO10, <laughs> it's time to finish. So, uh, just because in SO10, as you know, the fundamental representation is 16, it has the 15 standard model fermions, plus one, which is nothing but a right-handed neutrino. So you have type one. And, uh, but to give mass is to these right-handed neutrinos, the MN, if you want to give mass to the MN from uh, a renormalizable uh, coupling, then you need uh, 126 representation of SO10. And this contains a delta L. So you have also type 2. So this kind of thing, just to, to give you an idea. So in this case, you have to study this kind of... Uh, contributions. In general, the one which will domi the dominate will be the lightest one of these two states. And this is also something we did a very long time ago. So I think it's enough uh, for today. Thanks very much. Yeah. OK, I think we're pretty late. So any urgent questions for Thomas? I guess everybody's uh, hungry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can so imagine. let's thank Thomas for this very nice and comprehensive lectures on leptogenesis. <laughs>
it downstairs? Yeah. 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 Yeah